All right. This is a uh, new experience for me. I want to uh, say hi to everybody. My name is Kent Hardy. I have the honor of being one of the elders here at Faith Church, and I feel doubly honored to be able to come and share from God's Word with you today. Um, now, last week, Art Spencer came, and he kicked off a series about grace. And one of the things he reminded us of is just the definition of grace, that it's an undeserved favor, unmerited favor before God. He reminded us that no one actually deserves God's love. We all are sinners. There are no little sins. And we need to face those sins and confess them to God and seek his forgiveness. He also reminded us to extend grace to others. We need to forgive them. We need to not think of, their, of them as being worse than us because their sins are different than us, but to show them God's love. So today, as we continue this series on grace, I would like to share from Ephesians 2. And so this chapter contains one of the really classic texts about grace, and it's, it's really crucial for the Protestant evangelical way of thinking, especially. So Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, super famous verses, right? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And sometimes we remember to put verse 10 on the end of that. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So I grew up in the church, and like many of you, I've been around the church for a really long time. I've heard those verses over and over. I think if I went back through all the way to my childhood, I've probably memorized them half a dozen different times in different contexts and even have done so recently. Um, and for those of us who have been all around a long time, I think sometimes we forget that there's a larger context that those really key verses reside in. And so what I would like to do today is look at the entirety of Ephesians chapter 2, go zooming through it, and look at some big picture things that these really key verses highlight for us. So, those of you who are not like me, who didn't grow up in the church, this is still going to be great. There's so much information here in Ephesians chapter 2, and I am praying that God will um, really enlighten all of our eyes. Now, a little bit of context before we dive in. So, Ephesians is originally a letter. It was written to a particular church in a particular city called Ephesus by a guy named the Apostle Paul, that, that we call the Apostle Paul. It was a city in modern-day Turkey, and Ephesus was a big deal at the time. It was a big city. It was an important, powerful city. In fact, the Temple of Artemis in Ephesus was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was a famous, big place, and it turns out that the original uh, believers, they saw it as a crucial place to go to. And so we see in the book of Acts that Paul spent a bunch of time there, helping found a church. We see in the book of Acts that other people were there ministering in Ephesus. We see in Paul's letters that he sent people to Ephesus to care for the church. And we also know from church history that the apostle John went there at some point late in his life and ministered there, especially after his time at Patmos. He probably died ministering in the city of Ephesus. That's probably where he ended up. Um, so all of that to say, this, this letter was written to a particular group of people at a particular time, they're real people, and even though that's true, there's a lot of truth here that's relevant to us today. So that's what I really want us to, to think about. And so just one more tiny bit of background, Ephesians chapter 1, we're not going to read, but it starts, the first half of the chapter starts with this great, glorious offering of praise to God for what he has done in and through us, or in, in and through Christ for us, I should say it that way. Um, it's, it's just a beautiful passage. And then in the second half of the chapter, Paul decides that he's going to pray for the people of that church that they would be able to grasp what he's about ready to tell them. 
And so I would actually like to pray part of that prayer for over us as we get started here and before we dive in. Father, I pray that you would give us your spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of you, that you would enlighten our eyes, that we would know the hope to which you have called us, that we would know the riches of your glorious inheritance, and that we would understand the immeasurable greatness of your power toward us. Help us as we look at these verses today to see what you want us to see and hear what you want us to hear. The Spirit, please work in these hearts, in mine included, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Um, before I dive in, let me just also say there's no way that we can do justice to this chapter in like 25 minutes of me talking up here. Um, just for grins, I, I did a... Uh, many years ago, I listened to a series of sermons through the book of Ephesians by this guy named Martin Lloyd-Jones. He did 37 sermons on chapter 2, 22 verses. Um, so we are, we are zooming today by comparison, but I still think that there's something that we can learn. <laughs> um, so let's start by reading Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 through 10 and talk about that a little bit, and then we'll eventually read the rest of the chapter. All right, so Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Okay, so Paul starts out in verses 1 through 3 here by poking us in the eye. He says, by the way, before you knew Christ, you were dead. Now, of course, these people that he was writing to had been physically alive. They weren't physically dead. They were spiritually dead. He says that they were following the world. They were following, actually following Satan in what they did. He says that they were living by their own passions and desires. They just did whatever they thought came natural to them. But then in verse 3, Paul says something that's even more terrifying. He says that they were by, by nature children of wrath and that everyone is. In other words, what he's saying is that merely by being human we are deserving of God's wrath. That's, that is hard to understand sometimes. And our culture definitely does not agree with that, right? Our culture thinks that people are inherently good, and if we could just maneuver things around to be just the right thing, that everybody would be okay, and we'd all get along, and everybody would be happy. But that is not the message of the gospel. The gospel says that we are broken depraved people. It says that we are helpless, we are hopeless, and honestly, we don't even know it. And that's pretty bad news, right? That would be really bad news, except that verse 4 starts with, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Notice that he uses this word mercy. So this sermon series is about grace, and we already said grace is 
this sort of unmerited or undeserved favor, right? And mercy is kind of the flip side of that. So if grace is undeserved favor, that means, in other words, getting good things that you don't otherwise deserve. Mercy is the other side of that. It is not getting the bad things that you actually do deserve. So it says here that God is rich in mercy and that is because of the great love with which he loved us. And notice also in verse 5, it says that he loved us despite the fact that we were dead. So if you can just picture this with me for a second, we were rotting, stinking, nasty corpses. And God didn't look at us and go, you. He looked at us and he said, I love you. And he raised us up, it says in verse 5, he made us alive he raised us up with Christ, and he seated us in heavenly places with Christ. Now, I look around here, and this is a great place, but it's not exactly heaven, right? It says we are seated in heaven. And one of the things that you'll see throughout the New Testament is this concept of things that are already true and not yet quite fully realized. And we do not have time to unpack that today. But I encourage you to think about that. There is a truth here that we are seated in heaven. There's a, there's a way in which God thinks of us that is as if we are already there. And that is a huge blessing and a benefit. The other thing that Paul tells us is that we are saved by grace. He actually says it twice. He says it in verse 5, and then he says it again in verse 8. Right? And then he says, this is not your own doing. Remember, if you're dead, which he says you are, you can't do anything. You cannot save yourself. It is not your own doing. And it is a gift of God. There's nothing that we did or could do to deserve God's grace, God's free gift of, in his love for us. And keep in mind, not only were we dead, we were children of wrath. We deserve, we, we are utterly undeserving of anything good that God might do for us. And we were unable to change that situation at all. So if you really stop and understand the gospel, what it means is that any kind of boasting, any sense of self-righteousness, of me being better than you, just has to be firmly and consistently booted out of your mind. It cannot be. It is not true. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, period. Let me say it one more time. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. It is a truth of who we are as Christians. Now, interestingly, Paul also gives us a couple reasons why God decided to save us. The first thing, which I already mentioned just briefly in verses 6 and 7, it says that he, in the ages to come, wants to show the immeasurable riches of his grace to us. If you stop and think about that, it means that as someday when we're in heaven, that's not going to be a static situation. We are going to be learning and continuing to grow and understand more and more and more fully who God is, what he has done for us. And that understanding of his grace is going to be a continual increase in our praise and glory and honor to him all through the all through the running millennia as we are in heaven. I am so looking forward to not being bored in heaven and constantly learning more and more and more about this great God that we serve. The other thing it says here is that we were saved for the purpose of doing good works. So we do good works because of what God has done for us. We don't do them to curry his favor. In fact, there's nothing you can do to be in a more favorable position with God. You are already in the best place you could possibly be if you're a Christian. You cannot do better than this. So we need to remember that we are his workmanship. Some translations use the word masterpiece there. He is the master artist, not us. He is the one who's doing works through us. And so we work because he has done so much for us. We do good things for him. Now, these, we've flown through this passage, 
These are amazing, amazing truths, and we could spend weeks and weeks thinking and pondering on them, and I encourage you to do so, but, you know, God is so gracious to us, and we as individuals, a lot of what we've seen here is that we as individuals have been so blessed by God. He has given us so much by his grace, and honestly, this would be just in and of itself, this would be a fabulous win for us as human beings. But it turns out that God has more in store than just our individual salvation. He has a corporate aspect to all of this. And that's what we're going to look at in the second half of the chapter, is the corporate aspect of all of this grace that God offers us. So before I dive in, though, to the second half of Ephesians 2, let me give you just a tiny bit of background. And I want to just make sure that we're all on the same page about some terms that Paul's going to use. He's going to talk about Jews and Gentiles and circumcision and covenants and stuff like that. And I just want to make sure, a lot of you already know this stuff, but just in case, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. So in the book of Exodus, we read the story of how God rescued the nation of Israel from slavery and he called them to be his people. He made a bunch of promises to them, otherwise known as covenants, and then he required them to live in certain ways. One of those requirements was the ritual of circumcision, which was intended to be a physical reminder of a spiritual truth, that these people were God's people. The intention was never that the physical thing would be a thing by itself, but that it was indicative of a spiritual fact. But unfortunately, by the first century AD, when this was being written, a lot of Jewish people had kind of forgotten that. They thought that the physical act itself was what made them right with God. And even though they had misunderstood that, even though they didn't grasp that there needed to be a spiritual component to it, they still saw that act of circumcision as a reason to divide themselves from everybody else around them. So they they called everybody else uncircumcised, or they called them Gentiles. That would be another word. And so Paul uses both of those terms in the next few verses that we're going to read. In fact, many of the people in Ephesus would have been Gentiles, it appears, based on the text here. And I would guess that a large percentage of us are also Gentiles. So if we had been alive at that time and living in Ephesus, we would have been in this category as people who, didn't, who weren't Jewish and didn't have all this background of what God has been doing in the world, all right? The, other, the last thing I'll point out is the first verse, or the first word of verse 11 is therefore. In most of the translations, it starts with therefore. There's a few that don't quite start that way. But the point is that Paul is trying to make sure that we understand that what he's getting ready to say, starting in verse 11, actually links to what he just said in verses 1 through 10. All right, so let's keep all of these things in our minds, and I'm going to go ahead and read, starting in verse 11. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father, So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God 
by the Spirit. <clears throat> so Paul starts this paragraph again by reminding people of where they were before Christ came along. This time he says they were separated from Christ, they were alienated from Israel, they were strangers to the covenants, they had no hope, and they were without God. That's how he says their situation was. So this is very similar to that description that we read in the first three verses, right? And yet there's a different aspect that he's focusing on here. He's highlighting the fact that these Ephesian Gentiles would have had no chance to hear about God. They weren't even part of this Jewish background that would have given them at least some hints that God was there and what he might require. They not only were completely hopeless and helpless, they had no idea that they even needed anything. They were just doing their own thing. And again, the gospel is such good news because it says Christ came and God decided to do a whole bunch of stuff through Christ. So I'm just going to quickly list a bunch of these things that it says here. So in verse 13, it says that we Gentiles, we used to be far away, but now we've been brought near. He says that this dividing wall that had been put up between Jews and Gentiles has been broken down. He says on multiple occasions, verses 14 and 15 and 17, he talks about peace, that Christ brought peace between these groups that would have otherwise been hostile to each other. He brought peace to them. It's not just peace with God, but peace with other people. It says in verses 14 and 15, he talks about making one new man or one new person in place of the two. In verses 15 and 16, it says that he reconciled both groups to God. In verse 18, it says that both groups now have access to God. And he sums it up in verse 19 by saying, So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. In other words, what Christ is doing is he is making a new people group in this world. He is taking people from all over the world, Jews, Gentiles, and he's putting them together into a unified body that is one new people group. So if you are an American and you're a Christian, it means that you're a Christian more than you're an American. Now, you're still in this world and you're still an American and you need to act like one. At some level, we need to vote, we need to participate, we need to be part of this world system that we live in, right? But we do that as Christians. We do that with the kingdom of God at the front of our minds. Not acting like obnoxious Americans, but acting like people who love Jesus and want other people to know him, right? Revelation uh, chapter 7 gives us a picture of what this is going to look like sometime in the future. John describes a scene in heaven that will someday happen. He says, after this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the, nation, all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. That picture in heaven is because of God's grace. It is God's grace that not only saves us, but brings us together and lets us with one voice stand in front of God's throne and praise and honor him. So what do we do about this? I've gone zooming through this chapter and there's a lot that we could have dug into, 
But the first thing I would like to say is anyone who is here who does not yet know Christ, I hope that you will hear these descriptions that Paul wrote about who we are without Christ, that you will recognize the situation that you are in before God. And I pray that you will accept his gift. He is gracious. He wants to save you. Today is the day to be saved by grace through faith in Christ. Please do it. If you have questions or are wondering what that really means, ask someone near you. Maybe the person who brought you, ask them. Maybe that's a little uncomfortable and you'd rather come talk with a prayer team member. There's going to be people on the sides that you could come talk to. And for that matter, I would love it if you came and talked to me too. I would love to tell you about Jesus and about his love for you. For those of us who are believers, the first thing we need to do is remember, constantly remember who we were without Christ, how depraved our own heart is, how I have to remember how depraved my heart is without Christ, how much I needed to be saved. And then I need to remember the greatness of God's grace, how wonderful and amazing and awesome his love is. He is so good. He is so good. And then the second thing we need to remember is that God is making a new people group from all over the world, and we get to be part of making that happen. And not only that, we actually don't have to go very far to do that. If we looked at all the people that are living even within four or five miles of this property, we would see lots of people from all over the world, right? You see them every day. Wouldn't it be great if Faith Church looked more and more and more like that scene that we read about in Revelation? What a blessing that would be for us, but also wouldn't it be great evidence of God's grace? How great he is and how awesome that he could bring people together from such wildly different backgrounds and have them be together worshiping Christ. So my encouragement to you then is that you would see the people around you as people who need Christ's love and that you would just act accordingly. If you know Christ, you already know that you just need to tell people. You need to love them and care for them. We're called to be disciples of Christ who make disciples of Christ. And we just need to do that. And I encourage you to be thinking that way as you go out through your, your week this week. Let me pray, and the worship team can come back. Father, we are amazed at your love, your grace, your mercy towards us. We were so undeserving without you. We needed you more desperately than we wanted to admit or ever even thought about. Thank you for saving us. I pray that as we go out this week that we would remember who we are in you and that we would live in accordance with that. In Jesus' name, amen.